job is to turn the lights on. All right. Well, um, good evening, brethren and sisters. Um, welcome to everyone, and particularly to Sister Judy and Brother Sid from Canterbury. Um, and welcome everyone to the first Bible class of the year and what an appropriate subject to have, which is for Brother Sid to give us a bit of a summary on world events as they currently are, and we are certainly living in amazing times, so what a great way to start the year by just reviewing the times that we live. Now, before we commence, um, I'll ask you just to remain seated and we'll give a Heavenly Father uh, a prayer. Our great and loving Heavenly Father, we pray and thank you, dear Father, for your wonderful ways and we admire your wonderful name, Yahweh, which speaks of the time when your will will be done throughout this earth, a time when your ways and your character will be something that people will admire and seek for in their life. We know that is so different to this, the way we see the world today, but we live in a hope and have a faith that one day when your son does return to this earth, this world will change. What a wonderful time that will be and how blessed we will be, not only to know your wonderful word now, but to be inducted into your family and live a life of eternity and to be part of that whole process of changing this world for the better. We pray, dear God, for that day to come. We look forward to the day when your son will return. And we thank you for nights like this that we in peace and safety can consider a world in darkness and turmoil and see that indeed we are so blessed to know you and to know that the foundation of our lives is something that is permanent and that is something that's going to manifest itself to the world that is unknown to it right now. But indeed, they will respond when they see your dear son. We look forward to that day. We pray that you'll be with us as an ecclesia, that as individuals, as parents and as children, that we all may learn more about your, your wonderful word and prepare our own lives for the day when he does return. So we thank you for this opportunity tonight. We ask that it may also bring joy to you as it will to us. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. So, brethren and sisters, the subject tonight is current events and Bible prophecy. And Brother Sid has kindly um, accepted the invitation to come along to our meeting tonight and to lead us in that. And he's asked by way of introduction that we read 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you just uh, open your Bibles... Second Timothy chapter 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, Traities, uh, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so did these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium, at Lystra, 
what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things that thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Well, brethren and sisters, we'll now ask Brother Sid to lead us in the session tonight on current events. Thanks, Brother Sid. Right. Well, thanks, Brother Stephen, and uh, thanks to you all for the opportunity to be with you tonight. It's always uh, useful to visit other ecclesias and catch up with people who sometimes haven't seen for a while. Now, um, it probably be no surprise that there's quite a few uh, events around the world that uh, can a attract our attention at the moment. Now, one thing I was going to check, for people on this side, am I actually standing in front of the screen? Is it, do you, am I blocking that vision or not? It will work, Sam. OK, it's probably more when you're towards the front there. I can see with a bit of an issue. OK. Right, so uh, events. Now, you could probably list countless of them yourselves or what's going on around the world, but I thought we'd just... Uh, Take a, take a look at a few bits and pieces. Now, there was a Roy Morgan uh, poll that was taken in Australia, what people uh, thought of world problems. It's, it's 2021, so I can't actually track down a, their more recent one, which must exist somewhere, or whether they issue them late. But nevertheless, it gives a view of that people do have an opinion that there are world problems. And this was in the middle of COVID, so it was a time when people were concerned about a lot of the issues. And we won't spend too much time on it. We don't want to get buried in what are the detail that people considered. But uh, we noticed there that they're concerned about the economy, which may well be a reflection of self-interest, that they're concerned their income might drop or costs might go up. Uh, human rights get a, a fairly substantial mention. It doesn't particularly clarify what people think about that, so it's a fair chance that um, they're not sort of concerned about people um, you know, having religious rights. They're probably more concerned that people have the right to do what they like, you know, which is not always all that great. And so it goes through a range of other issues there. And we noticed that uh, energy and fuel and power was down fairly low, which you would imagine if you looked at it uh, a year or two later, that that would change. Uh, there's also a, a state of the world uh, survey, or not so much a survey, this one is more of uh, the editorial opinion of the fin Financial Times in the UK. So they would have taken on board a range of issues around the place, and you can see there, the, the concern about COVID, the war in Ukraine, food, energy, a couple of other strange ones, which you wouldn't necessarily expect, the inequality in vaccine distribution, which is interesting because that was, and still is at times, a huge issue where wealthy nations can get their hands on things and others who need it can't get hold of them. So interesting perception. Now, another one that was uh, of particular interest is uh, from the Secretary of the uh, United Nations, where not all that far back, last September, he said, our world is in peril and paralysed. We are gridlocked in colossal global dysfunction, which is a rather fascinating statement from the United Nations, which normally is full of rhetoric and holds meetings and makes profound statements that they will be able to resolve things and make... Uh, make headway. So it does, it does give you the impression that Antonio Guterres is perhaps being a little worn down by the job and becoming somewhat more objective and realising the world does have a lot of problems out there. Now, for those of us who have been looking at our Bibles for some years, we would think, OK, we're not surprised about that. And we won't go into all of Matthew 24, but it's a, a lengthy chapter with uh, commentary on problems and it talks about you know, you'll hear of wars and rumours and of wars. See, you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. And then we see a list of problems which can relate to the current era and others. 
For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and that classic line, and there will be great tribulation. So that doesn't sound very promising, but it does seem to link with uh, all that commentary about the problems around the world. It's interesting that we take on board what was the context of that statement about problems, and it's in relation to Jesus speaking to his disciples uh, when they're asking, well, what would we expect to see at the time of the end and the sign when he will be coming? And so that's the context of it. These are the sort of things that will precede the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's quite significant that we take on board, OK, there's a lot of problems. What do we perceive out of it? And just to make it clear that uh, it's not solely a New Testament issue. If we go back into the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel also spoke about times of trouble in the latter days or the last days of the world. And we can see there the key part, you know, a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. And he's talking about the time of the end. Uh, from the whole chapter we can realise that. And also it's quite clear to at a time when there'll be the resurrection. So that's also linked with the return of Christ. So it's not just a, a New Testament idea. It's been entrenched in the idea of the prophets uh, for centuries prior to that as well. So I thought, OK, maybe we should just have a, a bit of a spin around the state of the world. Um, I guess part of our issue, particularly in Australia, where we have problems, but they're not sort of insurmountable issues that really wear you out completely, or generally not. And we need to, in looking at the state of the world, try and perceive, OK, how bad is it right across the face of the earth? And if you're looking down on the earth, what would you see? And you do tend to see an enormous range, a great litany of problems, and we're just going to do a smattering of these, not to say these are by far the, the worst, but just an indication of, OK, if we're going to look at this from a global point of view, just how bad is it? We've seen that enormous effect of those uh, floods in Pakistan in recent months, uh, with hundreds of millions of people impacted, and it's almost impossible to perceive the, the misery that comes from some of these things, with a lack of resources to provide backup and support. And we see here people just sitting in a sea of mud uh, with no f food and uh, wondering when assistance will come, if it ever will come, or just work it out for yourself. And just as another smattering of issues, um, many African nations, particularly Somalia, have huge drought problems, people moving from their lands uh, into refugee camps to get away from it, uh, and that's becoming more widespread in a range of African countries. They've also got this huge problem of Islamic terrorist groups that raid villages, take people away, kill people, burn their crops. So <clears throat> sort of abject misery living in some of these places. And this is really <clears throat> what we need to look at from a total global perspective. Uh, the other interesting one, <clears throat> which because if you go into further detail on what people perceive as problems, a lot of people perceive as political corruption as an issue. Uh, and in certain parts of the world, that is a huge problem. Um, <clears throat> this is, again, just taking an example. This is a report by the Australian Institute of International Affairs, and they were basing it on Kenya. And this relates to so many uh, countries in Africa and quite also a lot in uh, South America operate in a similar approach, where it, politics in Kenya, dominated by rapacious elites, consumed with looting state resources and using violence to avoid any accountability. Elections serve as key points of entry and consolidation into this system and are manifestations of corruption, fraud and repression. And while the ruling elite exploit the state resources, the poor live in slums and survive on a dollar a day. So that may not impact on us dreadfully, but it's a huge issue for large parts of the world where people find that those in charge have no real interest in them and are looking there to serve themselves. And so a lot in Kenya would live in conditions such as this, while that very small percentage of the ruling elite live quite nicely and they don't really care or make any effort to solve the problems. We've seen the impact of COVID across the Western world uh, and we wonder, OK, is there a further pandemic around the corner from these things? As we've seen the uh, potential huge impact of how difficult it is to deal with. Uh, and, of course, we saw the appalling impact in the third world 
uh, where the deaths were most likely substantially understated and they would not really admit how bad it was. So it was a terrible problem which the world really struggled to deal with and it's only just getting on top of it now and even then it's not completely over. Uh, also, if you take a spin around countries around the world, you can find numerous ones where there's perpetual uh, civil unrest, lots of rioting in the streets, a lot of uh, South American and African uh, and some Eastern European countries have problems that way at the moment. And we have this global problem of uh, countless numbers of people trying to leave the country they live in, largely because their country is a complete basket case, will never get any better, it's economically ruined and there's no jobs, there's, no, uh, there's lots of shortages of everything and there's no way it's ever going to get any better and they all want to leave. Uh, but of course it's ridiculous that uh, hundreds of millions think that they can move out of their countries into other countries and so it's a, it's a massive problem for the world where people feel sorry for these people want to do something for them by the same token you can't just have large swathes of Africa and the Middle East uh, moving into Europe and it's always interesting they generally want to move to Europe, the USA, Canada or Australia so uh, no surprise that they want to be in countries that have some system that looks after people. Um, I looked up some of the uh, figures from the United Nations Refugee Agency and they're, they're actually eye-watering numbers. They're almost hard to believe how, how many people are affected this way. And their report states that uh, 103 million people are currently described as being forcibly displaced, that is, can't live where they would like to be. Around half of those are displaced within the countries that they live in, that is, they've gone elsewhere for safety or for food, um, and another 50 million or so have fled to other countries. They're quite sort of mind-boggling numbers, and these people just live in abject misery, even if they do often get to other countries. And the main sources of these refugees are Syria, Venezuela, Ukraine, Afghanistan and Sudan. And we often see these reports of people trying to cross the channel into, uh, into England or various parts of Europe across the Mediterranean. Uh, it's a hopeless problem. Uh, and we also see this massive armaments race around the world where hundreds of billions of dollars are thrown at uh, upgrading weapons and getting more and more. And we see that particularly at the moment with China and Russia and others trying to catch up to that. So, so that's just a snapshot of around the world. We could do that for, go on for another hour about world problems, but just when we look at it, we must look at it beyond Australia and say, okay, what is the state of the world? And it's, it's a great mess, really. And there's this great concern of massive uh, armaments race. Where will that end up? It's somewhere, somehow, one day, you figure somebody will let loose with something. Now, just moving on from that then, um, uh, we read from 2 Timothy chapter 3 and it talks about in the last days perilous times will come. So that's an interesting question, you know, perilous times, uh, and that's a verse that's no doubt, I'm, well, I know it has been quoted in countless Christadelphian talks over the years. Not that at the moment. Um, <clears throat> But, and just often in a general format of adding it to the problems of Matthew 24. But the effect is it's really quite different and speaking about different problems to those global general problems uh, that affect everybody and are described in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. It's talking about perilous times and we <clears throat> so it's obviously quite something that impacts on people and the question is, well, what type of perils is it talking about? And the issue is it's really talking about perilous times for believers. So it's, it's something quite different to that litany of general global problems that one would expect to see prior to the return of Christ. And it's really a warning to those who are believers to say, OK, in this latter time, there's going to be some particular challenges from the way people react. Now, of course, the problem we've got there is that, OK, how do you put a time frame on those things? And I'm sure that if you go back some centuries, you know, when people first started getting Bibles in their language and they'd look around and they'd think, oh, you know, the local lads in the village are being a bit, bit reckless. That's perhaps, you know, these difficult times and bad attitudes. But, I mean, that is really nothing compared to what it's really aiming at. And when we think about it, the, it's talking about a time when the outlook and attitude of many people has become self-centred 
and has become anti-religion. And I think we could say that there's a lot of evidence that that's the year in which we live, that we certainly would find that the prevailing attitude amongst people at the moment is perilous to believers. And if you start to follow the philosophies and views of the world, one will soon be in strife uh, as it is different to what God wants us to do. So what are, when we look at the sort of perils, we see that people are going to be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Okay, so it's a pretty ordinary state of affairs, but again, okay, how does one know exactly when you're into this time frame? Well, you can't tell exactly, but there has not really been a time in recent history that has become so anti-religion uh, and so self-centred as in the last few decades. So you could argue that there are, there's evidence around us that we're potentially sitting in these times. So I've got a little section here <coughs> which is called Enough Said because you don't need me to talk about it. I'm just going to put some slides up with a, a photograph and a verse and all you need to do is sort of read it and ponder and think, OK, is that reflecting the current situation? I'll just give you a few seconds to look at each one. Okay, that's just but a snapshot of the current world. You can work out for yourself if uh, the scriptural quotes have been overridden by the photos of the actions of people around us. And uh, I'm sure most people in this room would be well aware that there's been this enormous shift in attitude in two decades, even one decade, perhaps potentially even less with the, with the massive change in attitude to so many things of, uh, that would once not even been discussed, let alone thought of being a good idea. Uh, so they've had this huge shift. So I'm inclined to think that Second Timothy 3 is talking about clearly about this era in which we live. But the other challenge with quoting these things is, OK, you've got to get some handle on the, the time frame. You know, when, when, would, when would these... Uh, if, if you talk about the time of the end and things get difficult, how do we sort of put a time frame on that? Well, we're not told exactly, but we do have pretty good indicators that give you a a feel for the general era in which one is in. Now, one thing that was interesting is that uh, last year was the 125th anniversary of the first Zionist Congress. Now, that's, um, it didn't get a lot of uh, world publicity. It got uh, quite a lot of publicity in the Israeli press and also in the Swiss press because they held, held it in the Switzerland because that's where the first Congress was held. And there was a massive security shutdown across Switzerland and a lot of dignitaries, particularly Jewish ones, attended. Uh, but it seems like the rest of the global press decided not to run with it terribly much, uh, largely because it might make it look like they were anti-Palestinian or something because it's the, the trendy thing to be pro-Palestinian. Uh, so that was interesting. That uh, <clears throat> So it means that 125 years ago, a process was started that led to the re-establishment of Israel. And that really does give us a, a time frame because that, that had to happen before these things of the end could occur. So <clears throat> that's a completely separate topic which we won't talk about much tonight, but uh, it's just very useful for getting a, a, a handle on time frames. 
Uh, that was the first Zionist conference in Basel in Switzerland, and it, it set in train a whole range of issues, which we won't go through now, it's a separate talk, uh, that led to you know, the, the Balfour Declaration, the British supporting the, the separate homeland and the First World War, where the Turks are thrown out of Palestine, and then we end up in 1948, the State of Israel is born. So that's the uh, shortest um, lecture you've heard on the re-establishment of Israel. Now, that took five minutes. But uh, you know the background, so that's just to remind you. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that was in fulfilment of very significant prophecies, wasn't it? That Ezekiel 11, you know, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you've been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. So we've seen that occur. And there's also other issues that are relevant. We find in Zechariah 12 that Jerusalem is going to be a challenge to the world. It will make, a, will make a Jerusalem a couple of trembling unto all the people round about, and they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And then the next verse talks about events that are quite a big gap one would imagine between verse 2 and verse 10. And then later, after they're back in that land, we see that, uh, we'll pick up down the end there, when they look on me, that is Jesus, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Right, without going into all the details, that's showing us, of course, that Israel has to be back in that land before they would understand and accept that Christ really was their Messiah. So events have to occur to bring that about. So we can say that we are living in those times when when the return of Christ can happen and that the events around us in the world uh, sort of point to that, both the attitude of people and this wide range of global issues. Now, other events we do see, we've seen recently Netanyahu re-elected for the umpteenth time <clears throat> and with the usual Israeli shamozel of trying to get a coalition, he's finally cobbled together one that may or may not last. They don't have a great track record because, um, as they say, the classic Jewish thing and nobody agrees on anything and that reflects in their politics. Anyway, at the moment he's in power, he's got the most far right ring, wing government they've had for ages because he's had to do deals with a uh, lot of anti-Arab uh, groups and others so one waits to see where this would go and as we saw there that other comment in Zechariah, it says that Jerusalem in this area is going to be an issue for the world to watch. So a few interesting bits there. We note uh, just very recently, King Abdullah of Jordan was not terribly excited about the, the new government. And in response to some of their statements, he said, regarding Israeli settlements in the West Bank and the status of Muslim and Christian sites in Jerusalem, if Israel want to get into conflict, we're quite prepared. If they want to push certain red lines, we will deal with it. So it's quite a, a range of issues there. I just put these in um, to say this is a, a current event. Uh, we need to watch that as to where it's going to go, what it will do in relation to uh, the United States and the nuclear deal they're trying to pull with Iran, because Netanyahu was vehemently opposed to that, and the way things are going, maybe even the Biden administration may back away from that. And of course, we've seen Palestinian objection to a lot of this, so we wait to see what happens there, but again, we would expect ongoing activity. Now, of course, the, the big one we've been going on the last few months, or the last 12 months now almost, isn't it? We've seen uh, this situation in Ukraine, and you'd be well aware of it. You've seen no end of uh, media coverage of cities being destroyed, people being killed. It just goes on and on. Um, we've become familiar with the Russians just blowing things up and dealing with people. Uh, in the way they wish to, total destruction, misery and chaos everywhere. <clears throat> and of course the big issue is, well, how's it going to be resolved? Uh, will one side win or will the deal be negotiated? Now one thing is clear is that Russia is unlikely to relent. They'd look totally stupid if they did and you can't see it happening. And the other thing is, well, why this total amount of destruction? If Russia wants to take it over, why would you want to have all these cities destroyed? And that seems to be coming largely from this Russian attitude. They don't really care. They're not concerned about people or property. They just want control of an area to usurp power. Uh, they particularly want to prevent Ukraine 
becoming a further step of a Western influence or being an outlier of NATO. And that would seem to be their big uh, driving force. Uh, now, other things we've seen out of it, of course, is the Uh, we probably weren't aware until we, this recent war of just the huge extent of uh, European reliance on uh, gas supplies and other fuel from Russia. And we've become aware of that. Well, we knew there was one pipeline, but the way it spins off into Europe, and Germany in particular has been absolutely uh, dependent on their gas. And that's caused massive issues of how that's all going to work out. So that's been a huge impact on the world. Uh, and currently, it's but I'd get your mind around how the Ukrainians are surviving because it's freezing and they've got very limited power. There's not really a lot of um, media update on how they get by. You sort of wonder how on earth they stay alive in the conditions they're in. Uh, but somehow or other, I mean, obviously a lot of them have moved, they got out of the place, but there's still many there and trying to uh, cope with these terrible conditions. And the Russians, again, it shows their total lack of concern for people and they let them suffer to achieve their victory. Uh, the other surprise that I think came out of it particularly, but even more so than the fuel supplies, was the um, role that Ukraine uh, provides in supplying uh, food to large parts of the world, particularly in grains. Uh, enormous area of supply, and that's been largely shut down as well and causing havoc, especially for uh, low-income countries who really have trouble buying it elsewhere. And it was quite intriguing to see, um, the, just as an example, is their wheat, the other one is some of their other grains, uh, the number of countries that take huge amounts of supply from Ukraine. And although the Russians have allowed certain amounts out now, that's largely shut down and is a major problem for many, many countries. And of course, a lot of these are countries that are already living in a state of misery and abject problems and who add this to it. Now, I thought it might be interesting just to pursue a bit of background about Russia. I mean, the the Western press, to a large degree, has portrayed him as some crazy guy who thinks he can just go and take things over. Um, and although we certainly wouldn't want to justify anything they do, it is interesting from our background and interest in prophecy and the way, and the way Russia will probably play a role in that, is to be aware of what, what actually drives some of this um, approach. And it's not as simple as part of the West might allege, because from Putin's point of view... He likes to model himself on the really tough czars of the past, in particular Peter the Great. And um, the, it's an interesting perception because in the main they were brutal tyrants who applied indiscriminate torture and killing to opponents and they lived lives of particular debauchery, especially through the 1600s and 1700s. And as few of them were fairly well known, Ivan IV expanded Russia into Siberia and into the eastern side of Ukraine. And then there's Peter the Great, who amazingly built St. Peter's, St. Petersburg out of a swamp with massive amount of serf labour. And he captured Estonia, Lithuania and parts of Finland. So it's been the thing, if you want to be a powerful czar, to crunch people and expand the nation. And that's entrenched in their minds and influences Putin no end. Now, <clears throat> coincidentally, as it, that I was looking at some of this, I um, was reading a book called The Romanovs by Simon Seabag Montefiore, and he wrote this before the Ukraine war. And just a couple of quotes that are relevant to this. It's an interesting book if you are interested in the background to Russia, although it gets a bit daunting just reading how bad they were. Now, Catherine the Great, uh, a quote attributed to her is, Today is the happiest day of my life. Catherine rejoiced, for she had won a toehold on the Black Sea, a strip of southern Ukraine, an independent Khanate, that's an area ruled by a Khan, was one of the areas, the names they use in that region, uh, and the right to build a Black Sea fleet, which is one of the reasons why they always want to get those Ukrainian ports. And then uh, a comment on the 1990s decline of Russia, the sacred Slavic lands, Ukraine and Crimea, were lost to the motherland. The decadent West dared to push its influence into the new republics, Ukraine, Georgia, Estonia, right up to the borders of Russia. So these are <coughs> quotes in uh, uh, 
Montefiore's book, as I've written before the Ukraine war, uh, and pointing out it's a lot more detail than what's here, of course, uh, that they were really upset about lo losing Ukraine and Crimea because they figure it's part of the area. And then uh, the quote from Montefiore did continue that Yeltsin, like the Tsars, chose his own successor, being Vladimir Putin, ex-KGB colonel turned politician, to protect his, that's Yeltsin's family and legacy. Putin's immediate mission was to restore Russian power at home and abroad. And then it's interesting that paragraph about how he's done some of that, and blended Romanov authoritarianism, orthodox sanctity, Russian nationalism, crony capitalism, Soviet bureaucracy and the fixes of democracy, elections and parliament. And so he pushes all that together in that classic old way of the czars and controls and operates ruthlessly. Uh, he utilises the Orthodox Church where they can, uh, not because he's a believer, but it's a very effective way of generating nationalism and making out the church is on side with you. And interestingly, just very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the chief of the uh, Russian Orthodox, Patriarch Kirill, said the desire to defeat Russia has taken very dangerous forms. Any desire to destroy Russia will mean the end of the world. And that's a short grab from a lengthy talk he gave about why Russia is great and no one should try and oppose it. And that, of course, gives this religious attitude to what Putin is doing and, and, and it resonates well with the people, especially seeing they can control the press. Now, a bit of background here is relevant to what happened to him. Now, there was a ruler called Vladimir the Great back in the 900s, and he was the man who took um, what was then Eastern Orthodoxy into Russia, and out of which came the Russian Orthodox Church. So in 1988, he brought Eastern Orthodoxy to what was then called the Rus State, or the Rus State, and note where it was. It was centred in Kyiv. Previously, they were pagan peoples, and under Vladimir, it became a matter of convert or be killed. You know, not a great way to get your mind around a religion, but people probably figured, well, a new religion is probably a better shot than losing your head. So they went for it and it became the national uh, religion. And then, interestingly also, from around about the 12th century, these people, the Rus of Kyiv, uh, moved east, ultimately becoming the nation of Russia. So there is a connection, and this is what drives a lot of this Russian background. I'd better watch it, I don't get sidetracked into its history here. But uh, it is fascinating to know what drives their outlook and what motivates Putin and others. And it's summed up by an expression called Eurasianism, which is an odd word, but it's the belief that this whole previous Rus state of Ukraine and Eastern Europe is a unified landmass that must be retained as a complete entity, and that many as an entity for Russia. They really resent Western influence moving in because they believe this is clearly their ancient lands that they own. And it's interesting that it includes Kyiv. And when Vladimir ran the area, his palace and all that ran from Kyiv. And so Russia thinks, OK, this is the centre of it. This um, concept of Eurasianism is endorsed by a lot of um, Putin's advisers. And they keep telling him that you know, we are the people who own this part of the world. And it was um, one of his senior advisers who endorsed that was a chap called Alexander Dugan. And you might um, remember that event. It was his daughter who was killed when those Ukrainian special forces worked it out to bomb the car. They were apparently looking for killing off Dugan, and it would seem they were doing that because they were well aware he was a very influential advisor who kept endorsing this concept of that Russia should have this area. So there we go. Anyhow, uh, that's a bit of a snapshot of it all. And it, for those of us who have looked at prophecies that would include Russia over the years, it's interesting to be, be aware of some of these other backgrounds that drives their thinking, which I say it's a bit of a snapshot, but give you some idea of it. And we were well used to looking at uh, uh, chapters such as Ezekiel 38, which would be mentioned from here often, I'm sure. And... It talks about you know, the land of Magog, which is generally taken as that region of Ukraine, chief prince of Meshach and Chu, will be in Russia, uh, and then coming down, you know, Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Chu, 
and again, Johnny Tatum's Russia, I'll turn you about, put hooks in your jaws and bring you out, and all of them clothed in full armour and a great host. So whatever you take upon it, it's a mass of people coming down from these regions, whether they are exactly what, where they would line up, one doesn't know, but so we don't have time to go through all the background of why we would perceive them to be those countries, but um, that's a separate talk to show all the background. The other interesting part is it also goes on to about Persia, which is Iran, Kush, generally a bit of give and take, Sudan and Ethiopia, and Put being Libya. They all join with them. Goma, which is some of the European nations, and interestingly Beth to Goma, which most commentators will accept is Turkey, and a key part being they're all coming from the uttermost parts of the north. So again, it gives you a pretty good feel of where they're coming from. And you can't imagine there's any other huge, powerful nation other than Russia that would fit this description. And we notice also from verse 7 where they're heading up, upon the mountains of Israel. That's where that great host will go. So the thing we look for, I guess, out of all that is all these events will point to this at some point in time. We've been wise to put time frames on it, but it's heading that way. Um, now, I just also as a bit of an aside, as a, I should have mentioned, we're at the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, they have some interesting links there. There's actually two Ukrainian Orthodox churches now, and the fact that there was even one was annoying the Russians because they thought they should run it all. But the traditional one is the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which aligns with the Eastern Orthodox, which is now centred in Moscow and which they declare to be the absolute centre of Eastern Orthodoxy. And the other one has a subtly different name. It's called the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, rather than the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. It's been formed in very recent years because they want to disconnect from the Russian connection. Uh, it was formed in 2018. And interestingly, it lines itself up with the original Eastern European uh, uh, the original Eastern Orthodox Church, and it still uses the expression Constantinople, and it says it aligns itself with Constantinople. It might even use the word Istanbul. So just an aside for something of interest there, but uh, that's how they see their, their origins. All right. Uh, now, interesting, you see the linkages of those nations. Another current event, we can see Russia and Iran uh, certainly are pretty cosy in their arrangements. That would fit with that situation in Ezekiel 38, an aligning of those nations. So the question would be then, okay, well, where does this all take us from here with this war? It's obviously leading to something. Some interesting, very recent developments. Uh, you probably just saw the last week that the United States and Germany agreed to supply, and other European countries agreed to supply these leopard tanks to Ukraine. Uh, you wonder what has brought that about. Olaf Schultz, the Chancellor of Germany, has said it was never going to happen. So one can only assume that behind closed doors, the US has lent on him pretty heavily somehow. There's been some deal or some threat that come good and get these into Ukraine or else. I don't know what they've come up with. Uh, there's two views about that. Some say this is going to be great. It will let Ukraine oppose Russia more effectively. Others, other commentators and other uh, people connected with war attitudes contend it's a ridiculous idea. It will prolong the war, cause more casualties and possibly lead Russia to respond with nuclear weapons if they don't get their way. So who knows where that's going to go, so watch that one. Uh, there's a couple of thoughts of what things may happen. That Scenario one being that the various defeats in their in, with their land army will cause Russia to retreat, thus delaying further military action and potentially delaying Ezekiel 38 for a while. The other alternative view is that it might inspire Russia to take over the gas fields of Israel and Egypt and that new one they've recently discovered and are going to share with Lebanon. Uh, and that's interesting in the sense of its connection with Ezekiel 38 also, that uh, whether these nations of that area are connected with all that. So, so there are some suggestions that uh, you know, they're being defeated, but other views are they're really only using up their conscripts in the army, using a lot of, obviously using a lot of rockets and missiles, um, but not extensively using their very substantial air force, so they're still quite strong and could utilise that. Uh, have not really utilised their very powerful navy, so it's not as if Russia has been defeated and is militarily on its knees, so 
So these are huge issues to watch as to where that's all going to go. Uh, so they're the sort of key points in the world to watch. As I say, you can't nail them exactly with the prophecy, but they certainly line up with the Matthew 24, Luke 21 problems, 2 Timothy 3, uh, pointing towards Ezekiel 38 fitting in. You can't say that's about to happen, but it does show clearly that Russia is a, an aggressor, godless nation, despite its veneer of a religion it tries to put over the top. Uh, so that's about the the general state of affairs for you to think about. What I might do without getting, spending time on it, for those who might like to ponder other bits, you can just think about these. Um, uh, there's thoughts about where does Daniel 8 fit into this, so we won't address this tonight. Um, this talks about initially it would seem to be Antiochus Epiphanes, who in the Greek era, prior to the Roman occupation, uh, defiled the temple by sacrificing in it. And there's a thought that a latter day one will arise and some see that these descriptions fit Putin. Well, they do to some extent, but these descriptions will fit any aggressor and any terrible person who lands there. So whether it's Putin or another one, it would indicate that Daniel 8 points to a, a latter day Antiochus Epiphanes causing trouble. Uh, and just how it all lines up with Europe is interesting because we have various verses that point to a European or partial European connection with Russia. And I noticed interestingly in that connection, we get a lot of the Western press just saying that Europe's all on board. Well, there's a lot of doubt in... <coughs> excuse me. This is a, just a snapshot out of a very lengthy statement. But it's interesting that it reflects that a number of intellectuals and politicians in Europe are not convinced about this at all. Um, and this was Pierre de Gaulle from the famous de Gaulle family, grandson of the previous French president. He was obviously very anti-US and he was saying the United States is using the Ukrainian crisis to destabilise Europe. Uh, and the opinion piece went on to conclude by saying, well, surprisingly, his views have caused little shock because they echo the opinion of many leading public figures in the intellectual elite of France and no doubt elsewhere in Europe. So that's just another thing to think about. OK, are the Europeans going to hang in there with this or will they say, look, we're over Ukraine, it's easier to just in some ways align or appease Russia and get on with life. And the other verses there, just to, which again we won't get into detail this time, just for those who want to think about these, um, <coughs> Revelation 17 would point us towards the ten kings of, not necessarily literal ones, but maybe, uh, of Europe who align themselves with the beast, being the papal power, and also come down to make war on the lamb, presumably connected or a follow-on from Ezekiel 38. So there are events that might point to that as well, and that's more for people to discuss and think about. And so we'll finish just by reminding ourselves of Matthew 24 and where it all takes us, that when all these things are culminated, then we'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so it all points to that. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so... Uh, yes, yeah, so all these events which we just need to watch, I'm not going to give a definitive statement, but clearly we're in the time when they can come to total fruition and we will look to that day when we will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. So thank you for your attention. I hope it's given you things to think about. And if you're hoping for an absolute definitive answer, there isn't one. There's a lot of issues that are falling into place and we need to watch and see where they all land. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sid, for that rundown on uh, current events for the start of the year and I uh, appreciate you, you uh, coming to our class tonight and uh, Sister Judy. Um, is there any comments that anyone may have in the few minutes we have before we close? I'd like to add to any of the events that uh, Sid has talked about tonight.
Benjamin Netanyahu responded by saying that we are dealing with Iran in a covert way, so although the world may not see what's going on, we are not going to stand by and watch Iran get nuclear weapons. And as for the relationship with Russia, he said we want to keep our relationship with Russia because he said that one of the things that Iran wants to try to do is they want to try to establish a state on the Israeli border, which is part of Syria and things like that. And they said that Russia assists them in being able to control that area themselves without Iran getting coming into play. So there's this there's this play going on between between Israel's determination to stop Iran getting both nuclear weapons and also control of, on the Israeli borders. And therefore, they have to sort of stay friendly with Russia at this time and stay neutral in this in, in this war sort of thing. So it's, it's a really interesting conversation the way that Israel is trying to keep their balance between Russia, the Ukraine situation, and of course, the Iranian thing. So uh, yeah, it's a really fascinating debate. An inter interesting interview and, and lots more you know, stuff that, that they spoke about. Massive stuff that they didn't even ask. It's certainly, thanks Charlie, it's certainly a complex world and I remember, you know, back in the sort of the 70s and 80s, the lectures were always quite simple and simple to understand and you could geographically work out the whole thing quite simply, but even just the, the connections now and the way in which the worlds are relating to, the, the countries are relating to each other, I mean, even the situation of India at the moment, which has gone and got the Russian gas at incredibly cheap prices and taking full advantage of that and the tie in of India and Russia, which I do not know or understand, but you just think just the, the tentacles of Russia and the way in which they're working to try to manipulate world geopolitical situations is, is just quite outstanding and I think still well ahead of what the US consider to be sort of knowing everything. I think there's, they've still got manoeuvres there which the US haven't seen yet. So it, look, it's just amazing. I mean, uh, Brother Sid, uh, well done to give us a bit of a sh snapshot. We could have talked about the, the social divide that's happening in the US at the moment, which is just seems to be increasingly getting worse. And with uh, Trump most likely coming back into the presidential candidacy once again, it's just going to inflame the situation in the US. Um, but what Brother Sid did remind us is that whilst we aren't necessarily being impacted on that side of the, of the world events, we certainly have got our own uh, difficulties in Australia and most of which is contained in that reading that we had in 2 Timothy where he talks about the self-centeredness of our society and that lack of God's sent, the lack of just having God in one's life anymore in this country is become manifest in so many different ways as we saw a little bit of an example tonight. So thanks again uh, Sid and uh, Judy for coming along tonight, that was lovely. Uh, we're now going to conclude uh, our um, class tonight, um, if you just remain seated and Brother John Boardman will give prayer and give thanks for the supper. Thanks John. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your great and holy name. Lord, as we contemplated tonight, we know that your will is being worked out amongst the kingdoms of men. There are many strange bedfellows, Heavenly Father, and yet we see uh, the world coming uh, to a time of great trouble where nations become desperate and where there are wars and rumours of wars, where there are all sorts of difficulties, and so we know that the earth cannot exist for a long period of time without the return of your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his healing hand upon uh, this troubled world. Be with his Heavenly Father. We, we long for his appearing. And we know, O oh Lord, that those that long for his appearing will be rewarded uh, by your grace at his uh, establishment of the kingdom. 
Be with us as we go from this place, as we preach in the time that remains. Uh, take us safely to our houses. We pray that you'll be with all those that have need at this time. Be they in third world countries, Heavenly Father, or here uh, in Australia. For there are many that need your assistance with infirmities of the flesh, with concerns and troubled mind. Um, be with us, Lord. And we realise that you are so good to us and we thank you uh, for the provision of the refreshments which we're about to partake of. We know that everything we have is given by you and can be taken away at any time. And so we are so grateful uh, that you uh, look upon us with generosity. We thank you now through our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now offer this prayer. Amen.